Sims.
Friends, before we begin the official part of our service, uh, it has been customary for us just to go through the COVID protocol that's in place. Um, we're going to ask that you would keep your masks on for the entire service. But if you do feel overwhelmed and you need to take a nice big deep breath, please feel free to step outside and have a few breaths and rejoin us. I promise you we won't uh, be offended at all. Um, if you need to make uh, use of the amenities, you can follow this passage down to my left-hand side um, and through, and you'll see that there are two bathrooms that are open there, um, which you would be able to use. We're not singing in the service today, but um, we will be having a nice full service and the service is being live streamed on our Facebook page. And I'm hoping that those who uh, are not able to be with us today are with us online and uh, that they feel part of the service uh, during this time. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Weeping may remain for the night. Rejoicing comes in the morning. The Lord promises us that he will never leave or forsake us, and especially in our time of need. Friends, let's bow our heads as we offer up this time in prayer to God. Almighty and heavenly Father, you have gathered us into this place in order that we would not only meet with you, but that we would find comfort and solace in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, it is when we are confronted by the dark night of death that we are drawn to your light, to your love and to your hope. And so, Lord, as we seek out your presence today, we ask that we would hear you through the scriptures. We'd have an opportunity to say our hearts, brokenness and desires in our prayers. And as we listen to the words of memories spoken, that they would comfort our hearts too during this time. Lord, allow your Holy Spirit to move amongst us and to minister to each of us no matter where we find ourselves in this dark night. And so, Lord, we commit this time into your presence now. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, as we gather today, we have come to, to do three things. Firstly, to meet with our Lord Jesus Christ in our time of need. Secondly, to give thanks for the life of Mitch and for all that he has meant to us through the years that we have known him. For the beloved father and father-in-law, for the brother and cousin and dear family member and friend to many of you who are seated here today. And finally, we're here to offer him up to the Lord that he might rest in peace. And so, friends, as we embark on this journey today, we are going to hear from some of those who are near and dear to Mitch, as well as I have a couple that have a couple of the family members that have asked me to read various things. But uh, we're going to start with those who are going to speak first. And uh, so we invite you up uh, to the podium to share those memories with us. Who's going to go first? <laughs> so I'm going to say everything the rest of you are going to say so tough. Am Would I? You? I can project my this voice. This is for the Facebook. Oh, okay. And I'm allowed to. It's okay to. Well, take off my mask. Yes. Let me do that. 
For those of you who don't know who I am, I'm one of Mitch's cousins. Lucy, what, third? No, youngest, I think. Or second youngest, by, by not much. Mm -hmm. I got into Joburg on Monday evening, I think it was. And I'm not sure, I was a bit concerned that because the flight was delayed two hours and then they lost 50 of us, our bags at the airport, I was concerned that Wheeze would go home and because I didn't have an international SIM card that I couldn't contact her. They stayed at Mitch's place, which was fortunate. And I'm not sure how we got onto it, but I said something about the two birds, the two duck corps that live in the back garden. And we said, oh, she hasn't been able to feed them for obvious reasons. She had more pressing tasks. So the next morning, I was having breakfast, and I heard their distinctive call. And I thought, fantastic, they're still here. They've been here for at least a decade. And of course, Mitch isn't here, so I can't say, Mitch, how long have they been here? Then I saw the other bird. So both of them were still there, and both of them were still breeding there. And Dickups don't breed where they don't have a safe environment, which is protected, and where they don't get food. And I think that's pretty indicative of both Mitch and Maggie, that they provided a safe environment. Come on, this is stupid. And had two fantastic children who themselves had fantastic grandchildren. I'm not an emotional person and this is silly. I'm fine. Well, the other part of, of this is that Mitch was the oldest of a gang of eight of us little monsters. And the other hooligan was Tony. And I had a weird, in, uh, I thought Mitch was actually 14 years older than me. And when you're little and someone is that much, Mitch wasn't 14 years older. But it seemed like that. And with what Tony and Mitch used to do, which horrified the rest of us, which were basically being little hooligans, Mitch turned out, and Tony, seeing as you're still alive, so I can say this, he actually turned out to be a really good human being, a mensch. A very compassionate person, but he didn't actually show it. And he was certainly someone who was very generous and unfortunately people and several neighbors who I won't mention took advantage of this. But his generosity from what, he, what I remember him as this Texan smoking monster that would, I was talking to Tony now about this, would make arrows and then screw dart heads onto the end of arrows and go and hunt the neighbor's cats. <laughs> and destroy all the bird life, all the mossies with pellet guns, we all had pellet guns, and set traps for these things. And he turned, I lost contact for decades. And then I re found contact again from my sister, who was another of the gang of eight of us, who's in Tasmania, that's Dawn. And she and Mitch had maintained contact for decades. They used to write often. And, well, I haven't seen Dawn for 35 years. And she hooked me up with Mitch again. And I thought, oh, Mitch, really? This Texan smoking hooligan. But I also knew Mitch from Witz, where I did geology. He was much older. So he was the senior lab technician. And he'd come into the lab and I'd go, oh, here's Mitch. And he'd bring in the slides the microscope slides and check things. 
when I re-established contact with him, I was actually quite amazed at what a... He was, he was soft in his manner, but he was loud with his voice. But he wasn't a loud, obnoxious person. And as I say, he turned into this fantastic human being who has produced fantastic children. So my memories of Mitch in that regard, starting with the whole gang of us who used to run around all over the neighborhood. And Mitch, unlike the rest of us who moved all over the place, Mitch is the last link with the Mesh family, with the three sisters, and the oldest brother, Michael, who died of septicemia in 1944. And then Mitch came along not much more than six months later, which is Mitch was named after Uncle Michael to remember him and actually ended up as the surrogate son for our grandparents. So a lot of the oral tradition of the family came through from our grandfather through Mitch to the rest of us. And part of that tradition was, well, goes back at 120 years because our grandfather, Jiddu, came to South Africa with his grandfather in 1900. And they ended up here in Johannesburg in 1901 during the height of the Boer War. And the apocryphal story, which I'm still trying to check up on, was that as an eightlander, he was told, you either join us. And Mitch said, Judu had told him, Paul Kruger said to our grandfather, I don't think it was Paul Kruger. He was too busy. But that was the story. Either join us or leave. We're in a war. And apparently, Judu joined the Boers and got a sword and a hat and a bandolier and obviously a rifle. He handed the rifle back. And part of what interested me, because Mitch was also an historian, I went to the war memorial up near the zoo. I had an appointment with one of the permanent staff to try and find out more about this, even if I could get a photograph of Jiddu. But apparently, um, the the, the, the Boer soldiers never registered the way we did. They never had a number. They never had a formal designation. It was ad hoc. And even the rifle he got, the, the number for the rifle wasn't registered. So there's, there, are, there is no data that I can use to trace this. And we spent quite a bit of time trying to do this. I was also told then, if there are any records, they're down in Bloemfontein. The point is, Mitch was the person that used to sit with Jiddu in the fowl hock at the back and listen to his stories. So he also learned fluent Lebanese. And I believe Lucy also speaks Lebanese. He was the last link that had this oral tradition of the family. And because he never left Kensington, unlike the, the rest of us, he knew the history of the Lebanese community, of who lived where, who their children were, who their grandchildren were, where they went to school, where they went to work, what cars they owned. He also learned to play the piano with Auntie Matty, who lived at the top of the hill. And I, Dawn, my oldest sister, also went there for music lessons. So for all of us, and I tried to get Mitch to write down more of those types of history of Kensington, which for the family go back at least 100 years. I mean, there's stuff in the garage there that's from our grandparents, for heaven's sake. It's 120 years old. Now poor old Weeze has got to get rid of this stuff. <laughs> and it's stuff. So unfortunate, well, we still have some of this oral tradition. Mitch did write down a lot of it. But he's the last link with the history, not only of Kensington and how it developed, but of Johannesburg. Because most of us forget that the reason Joburg is here is the gold. And it's the biggest city in the world that is not on the ocean or on a major river. And that tradition goes back to our grandparents who started in Gold Street and then moved to Kensington. And when they moved to Kensington and Mitch was born, most of the roads were unpaved. And Mitch would tell us stories about unpaved roads with dust, with a few houses, and it was still open. I remember shooting 
a snake in the kitchen in 248 Highland Road that, that was still pretty wild. So unfortunately, a lot of that oral tradition, we have some of it, but we have, we've lost a lot of it with the loss of Mitch. I'm going to stop using up the oxygen. I will end off with the last line of one of Wilfred. And I've done this before at quite a few other places where we had various troops who were buried. Last line of one of Alfred Owen's poem. For Mitch and Maggie. Let us sleep now. <laughs> All right, mask has to come off. I don't project quite as well. Um, I think the one thing uh, that we all knew about Mitch was his complete lack of a filter. Um, <laughs> and that's... When it came to Mitch, what you saw was exactly what you got. Um, a very refreshing change from most people, um, and, and certainly someone who would tell you exactly not only what he thought of you, but um, your entire family, <laughs> your pets, and the car you drove. Um, at the same time, and you know, his, his complete openness with people, I think all of us here know exactly how his childhood was and that there were two polar opposites by way of parents. Um, his mother, who was warm and loving um, and a bit of a tyrant, and his father, who was, quite frankly, a monster. Um, Mitch had an opportunity to choose which direction he preferred. And um, he chose the one that's brought us all together here today. Um, being what I would, I, I would always regard him as the ultimate family man. And um, someone who would happily welcome you into his family, provided you treated his family with the right degree of respect um, and affection. And that's really, I mean, I could go on for hours and we probably will later on. But I thought, I thought it was just important for me to say that I became a member of the family in large part thanks to Mitch. Uncle Mitch, I still can't believe I'm standing here saying a tribute to you because of your passing. Words can't describe this difficult moment, but if this is the last time I get to say goodbye, then I know I'll do it with some knowledge that I consider myself blessed to have lived a life as your nephew. You touched so many people with your larger-than-life personality and dark tan, which took many, many lunch breaks to perfect. You're the only guy I know that could rock a white lab coat, Adidas slops, and a budgie smuggling speedo all at the same time. <laughs> Your second to none sense of humor and contagious laugh always caught an entire room's attention. You were a man of your word and you gave everything to the people who mattered to you. Uncle Mitch, 
You were and always will be an inspiration to me and anyone fortunate enough to have spent time with you. You've left a void that will never be filled. While we mourn today, we also take comfort in the fact that your mission on earth has been fulfilled. You made many smile and laugh, and you were a kind soul and a special human being that helped lots of people in all sorts of ways. I'm glad that you're at peace now, and I'm sure that you're sharing guitar tricks with Elvis and John Lennon whilst entertaining your mom and your wife. Farewell and fly free. I've got a couple that I've been asked to read today, and the first of those come from Clint. Um, I never realized a lot of these things about my dad until I had to write them down. His mom called him Michael, mostly when he was in trouble, but everyone knew him as Mitch. My dad was someone who really loved life, even when he was complaining. He often found joy in the most simplest of things. A simple, funny line or a sound from a movie was often repeated with an attempt to duplicate the accent or sound as close as possible. He would drive us nuts and repeat it over and over again, especially when getting ready for work in the mornings while shaving. Weez and I used to think this was really weird, but looking back, it was his way of being happy in the mornings with his family. There were very few things that he did not like. He definitely did not like wearing a shirt and long pants that were not worn often. He was, when he was behind the wheel of a car, he did not like any of the other drivers on the road and often told them so loudly. He was also an uncomplicated man who didn't have great work aspirations and avoided pressure and conflict when he could. You could see the kindness in the way he treated others less fortunate, treated the less fortunate people and animals. He was content to just be in the company of his family and loved us all very much. He made many sacrifices for us when we were growing up and worked really hard to give us a good footing in life. He often gave up his own hobby time to cart and fetch us from our hobbies, although I su suspect he secretly loved driving the band bus because it reminded him of the days when he used to gig with his band. He often used to tell, tell us stories of his early life, and there were many, many, many stories he loved telling stories, especially if they were funny. One of the more recent ones that stuck, struck me will give, you an idea of the, will give you an idea of how he used to operate. When he was 15, he accidentally broke one of his grandfather's windows with a stone. His granddad made him go and buy a new window and window putty, and as a lesson, he had to learn how to fix the window himself. Within a week, he and his friend, Neville Wagner, had set up a small business fixing windows in the neighborhood in Highland Road. Neville would break the windows with a catapult, <laughs> and my dad would offer to fix them with glass and putty included in the offer. My dad was a very loyal person. He only ever worked two real jobs, one as a typewriter salesman for Olivetti for, few, for a few years, and then as a technician for Witz University that lasted him 42 years. His marriage to mom was just as loyal, and they managed 52 years together. He loved her dearly, although he never said it in front of us, but from his actions, we knew he did. He, was, he never was comfortable with emotions and expressing his feelings. He never really told Weez and me that he loved us verbally. He showed it in many other ways. 
He did recently say, I love you, my son, to me, probably because I said it first, and I reckon it was the only time he did. It was enough for me. He was the legend that is, he was the legend that is Mitch, and was known all over the university for wearing a Speedo and a white coat next to the university pool. There is not many students who went to the pool that did not know him and his quirky ways. My fondest memories are him teaching me music and playing in the band with him out on stage. He was very proud of both Wheeze and I and our band activities and often told others how proud he was. I will always think of him when I see a kite flying, a fishing rod in the water, a, stream tr a steam train, or hear an electric gu guitar played on its own, a funny line in a movie, or just simply sitting in the sun, smiling, which was definitely his favorite thing to do. Then from Louise, my pops, popsicle, dad, daddy, Mike, Michael, Mitch. What can I say about my dad? I too never realized how I, I too never realized I would be here today telling you stories of my beloved dad, played the guitar, Elvis hair, 60s ducktail dude, go to guy, bry master, camp master, husband, fisherman, steam train addict, and of course, a sun crazed sun bum. Oh, yes, he loved sitting in the sun. That was his favorite to pass the time, and of course, he hated the cold weather. A dad to many who looked up to him, to so many who knew him, his colleagues at Wits, his neighbors, his family, his siblings, he was in many ways a well. Should I say a jack of all trades guy, technician, mechanic, electrical guy, especially if your iron toaster, heater or anything that broke, he fixed it without hesitation and loved doing a lot of things with his hands. In our youth, dad would get all his friends and their families to come to the old Mildura house in Kensington, in Kensington to watch real to real movies. One of mine and his most favorite highlights over the weekends. One of my fondest and best memories is a dear friend and uh, as I called him, my other brother, Gordy, who was and still is Clint's best friend. Dad would call him up as Gordy lived up the road from us. Hey, Gordy, we're having fresh, we're having fruit hash and ice cream. And within seconds after calling Gordy, you got this ding at the door and Gordy was there. That was my, one of my dad's favorite, making all of us this delight. My dad always made sure that if we were out clubbing or out partying with our friends, he said, you call me any time during the day or night, even if it's 4 a.m. in the morning, I will come and fetch you. Him and my mom, bless their dear souls, were great supporters of the Irish and all the other ba pipe band members. They loved each and every one who came to chat with them. These will be the days when we get back to playing, the, playing again. I will miss that the most. Dad would drop everything to be that awesome family man. He treated and loved my mom like a queen. He made sure that we did everything together. Pipe band gatherings, family Christmas, going to the zoo, go kart racing, fishing, riding our bikes, taking me horse riding, taking Clint to scouts, and best of all, riding the steam trains. When I went to swimming, when we went to swimming as kids, he would, 
play with all of us in the pool and put us on his shoulders and shoot us into the air, diving off into the water. He would do this with all the kids, including his grandkids, who thought this was great fun. Too many, he will always, too many, he will always be Mitch, who mows the lawn in his speedo, <laughs> blushing. <laughs> because most of the time he had no shirt on if it was hot. I have such, a, I have such cute memories of dad, who had some strange sayings and always liked to repeat them while he would be shaving, before he would go to work. And this would be a daily occurrence he would do. It became a habit, and we would just laugh. There he goes again. He had another habit of patting us on the head. To that was and always was his affectionate side. Dad also had a naughty streak, and being half Lebanese, he would teach us how to swear in Lebanese. But to our knowledge, we were just learning Lebanese sayings. We were still small at the time, and we actually thought it was quite funny, until he actually told us, when we were a bit older, what the words actually meant. Blushing again. He loved giving us all nicknames. I was Wheeze, Wheezy, Wheeze Woo, Mully Woo, Piggy Bo, and Baba. Pops, I really tried my best to help you to feel better, and I'm sorry for messing up your filing system you had on the table in the dining room. Don't worry, Pops, I will sort it out. Clint and me are so proud to be your son and daughter, and thank you for all that you did for us and for Mom, your family, your sisters, granddaughters, and everyone around you. I will miss you the most and forever. Gone too soon. Full steam train ahead, Dad. You've earned your wings. Love your Baba Wees. In a message from, from Lucy, um, that's Mitch's sister, in loving memory of Mike, Mitch Miles. I am sad that you had to go, Mitch, but relieved that you are no longer in pain. I treasure the short time I shared with you at the end, the years we shared, to, shared as brother and sister and all the fun times. I still remember you when you surreptitiously used my mom's sewing machine to change your school trousers into tight stove pipes. <laughs> your determination to play Elvis and shadows music on your guitar to perfection. You were well known by all who used the Witt swimming pool. Our family celebrations were always enriched by your humor. Not only were you an amazing husband, father, grandfather, and uncle, but a good friend to all who knew you. How we, love, how we used to love dancing to your music. As a family man, you were loving and caring, supportive and always watching our backs, helping with repairs and always the humorist and entertainer at family gatherings. I know that you are looking at Clint and Louise with so much pride in their achievements, their shining examples of your good parenting. Thanks, my precious niece, you have been a brilliant, an absolute pillar of strength, and Dad is so proud and appreciative of his Baba. I treasure the many beautiful memories and hold you in my heart for eternity. Farewell, Mitch, and rest in peace with your beloved wife of 52 years. We hold you in our hearts forever. Lucy. And from Tanya, who's a close family friend. Eulogy to Mike Miles from Tanya, Cliff, Taryn, Duran, Mike, Kim, and the boys. It's taken a while for me to be, have been able to put pen to paper to write this eulogy. How does one write a eulogy to someone 
who was larger than life and who seemed immortal. To most of us, it was inconceivable that Mitch would one day just simply not be around. His chalkling belly laugh, dressed in his trademark rugby shorts, his passion for the sun, his jokes and quirky sayings have become legendary and these memories will live on for generations. Some things can only ever be described in Mitch speak. Our Christmas Eve dinners were his and Madge's special time with our family. We enjoyed hours of laughter when Mitch got going. His jokes kept everyone in peals of laughter. Always pan-faced, he would expound joke after joke. Kim, Tyron and Duran and their friends couldn't wait for Mitch to start on his repertoire, often egging him on. Mitch was always the life and soul of the party, especially when he took out his guitar to play his famous leakies. Louise and my harebrained scheme to fix up the derelict Marshall Street band room, getting the fires ready for the band after the sunset parade at the Jock of the Bushveld, Bushveld Chalets in Barberton, was never any effort for Mitch. He always turned the mundane into huge fun. Most profound was his love and commitment to Mags, Clint and Wheeze, and later for his granddaughters, Amy and Galen, and for whom nothing was ever too much trouble. Next came his love for his guitars, and when visiting, one would often enjoy Mitch and Mag's fam Madge's famous duets. They were fantastic. Not far behind was his and Madge's commitment to the SA Irish, Irish. Unless either of them was ill, Mitch and Mags never missed a parade or competition. The famous deck chairs were positioned beside the competition circle. Mitch is always in the sunniest spot, supporting the band. Everyone would pop past for a chat and a joke. The saddest moment for me is going to be when we finally get to march out at the next gathering. And the two deck chairs are not there, flanking the circle. Only then, the profound loss will be evident. Mitch's love for Mags was an example to all who knew him. In 35 years, I have rarely seen one without the other by their side. They did absolutely everything together. Mitchy, it was never going to be long before you joined your beloved Mags. Go well, my friend. Fly with the angels. Give our love and hugs to Mags. From Tracy, who's one of the nieces, Clint and Wheeze. I'm sorry I couldn't be there with you today, cousins. Your old man was so special to all of us. He was the maker of so many childhood memories. From his jokes around the Christmas table to arriving at our place with his cooler box full of color colors in his speedo, ready for a goof. He loved life and marched to the beat of his own drum. There was never a dull moment when he was around. And as much as I'll always remember his larger than life personality and quirky sayings, I'll never forget his kindness and patience with Brad and me. He was always willing to hop in the pool with us, tell us endless jokes, play trains and pat us on the head. Good link, Tata, Mit Uncle Mitch. The big tree may have fallen, but you will be with us in spirit always. T. Lee Pop. And finally, from uh, Mitch's sister, Scylla, it's time to wish you a happy journey to the next dimension. 
Sadly, you never made it to visit me in your favorite country, the USA. I will miss your happy 4th of July emails. I hope you get to meet Elvis and play, play Jailhouse Rock with him. Love, Scylla. I haven't uh, known many of you for a long time. I uh, came into contact with Louise over the last couple of years, and it was when Maggie died that I met Mitch for the first time. And we came through to the office, and even though it was a somber occasion, he still managed to find an opportunity to break the ice and to tell a few jokes and a few stories. As we talked about his beloved wife, there was a smile on his face and in his heart as he recalled fondly those memories. He spoke about Louise and Clinton with such affection as he recounted all of those memories to me. I don't think any of us could have predicted that we would be here a few months later. Friends, I really just want to share one scripture reading with you today and a short message. The scripture reading comes from John chapter 11, and I'm going to be reading from verse 17. When Jesus arrived and found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. He said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. Those who believe in me will live. Do you believe this? Jesus said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and calling for you. When she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews that were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. And so the Jews said, see how he loved him. Friends, as we confront death again and far too soon that we are still processing the death 
of Maggie, we are met with a second dark night. And perhaps we feel overcome by all that we've been through over the last few months. And in that overcoming, perhaps what resonates within us is what Mary and Martha both say to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Perhaps we are looking for the answers to the deepest question of why now, why at this time, why so soon? And there are many questions that we ask. Questions about living through a pandemic and how it's affected us emotionally and spiritually and how if Mitch had seen a doctor sooner, would there have been help? If he hadn't got COVID from his first round in the hospital, would he have been able to, to fight longer and harder? Today we are left with all of these unanswered questions. And for many of you, we want to deal with this thing logically. We want to tell on our minds that Mitch really was not well at the end. And that this was a blessed release for all of us. But most especially for him. For the suffering and the pain that he experienced in those last few weeks. But a colleague of mine always says that the longest journey is from our heads to our hearts. Our brains may have worked it all out and told us that this was for the best. But how do you begin to tell your heart that your father needed to go or that it was for the best? How do we come to terms with a loss? A loss that is left a huge void in our lives. This particular passage of scripture talks about two sisters, Mary and Martha. And for those of you who are um, familiar with them in the scriptures, this is not the first time that we're meeting them. But one of the things about these two sisters is that they view life very differently. And not only do they view life differently, but they deal with death very differently. And so we have Martha, who is the doer. And as soon as she hears that Jesus has come, she gets up and she goes and she meets him and she attempts to engage him and to wrestle with him about what has happened and where and how and get all the details. And then we have Mary who is at home, crying in amongst her family and friends that are trying to console her. And I think this is a beautiful text because it gives us the freedom to grieve in the way that we need to. There is no one specific way or journey in grief, but wherever you are in your grief, in dealing with the loss, the multiple losses, I want to tell you today that that is okay. Whether we are at peace or whether we're struggling, whether we're asking questions, whether we're angry, whether we're frustrated, whether we're just inundated with emotions and tears. Wherever you find yourselves, 
it's okay. The community is with Mary, was with Mary and Martha before she got up and left to go and find Jesus. And it is at times like this that community and family becomes so important. Not only for the love and support that they give us during this time and the understanding, but it is in looking to our family and our friends that we're able to see the face of Mitch. It is in talking with one another that we begin the process of grief, of understanding and unpacking this overawing burden of grief. And although the memories are difficult to think about now, and they, they give a real sense of loss and sadness in us, my prayer is that you would continue to talk about Mitch and Maggie in the weeks and the months that lie ahead, not to be afraid of the emotion that it brings up for us. For that is how we keep them alive in our lives, in our memories, and for those that we love. This text contains what they call is the shortest verse in the Bible that reads, Jesus wept. So often we want to put Jesus on a pedestal, overarching, understanding everything, above human emotions. And yet, at the death, of Jesus' friend Lazarus, he was drawn to tears. It is okay for us to weep and to be sad. And not just for today, and not just for tomorrow or the week to come, but for the weeks and months that are going to lie ahead of us. Grief is, is not an ended process after this funeral. Despite what the world wants and tells us. The world wants us to be back to normal. Business as usual once this service is over. And perhaps you'll get a little bit of time as you wind up your dad's estate. But then when everything has been dealt with, we must go back to being happy, confident, normal people that the world can deal with. But grief doesn't have that kind of timeline. Grief has a timeline of its own. It plays by its own rules. And so I want you to allow yourself and not to feel guilty in weeks or months time where you still feel the deep void of the loss of a father and a friend. To be kind to yourself and to be kind to those who might be weeping and mourning too. When Jesus cries in this passage, those that were gathered say, see how they loved him. It is in our tears and in our emotions at the loss of somebody that we love shows how much we loved and cared for them. May God give you his peace that surpasses all understanding. Amen.
Friends, we are going to stand as we do the committal of the late Michael Miles. So I'm going to ask you to please stand. Michael is going to be cremated in a private ceremony, and so we do the committal now. Listen to these words. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. We have entrusted our brother Michael Anthony Miles into the hands of God, and we now commit his body to the elements, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, having our whole trust and confidence in the mercy of our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who died, was buried, and rose again for us and is alive and reigns forever and ever. Jesus says, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead And behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys to death and Hades. Amen. I'm going to ask you to please be seated. Friends, I'd like to close with this prayer that is entitled, A Prayer at an Empty Chair. Let us bow our heads. Dear God, there's an empty chair at our table, an ache in our hearts, and tears upon our faces. We try to shield one another from our grief, but we cannot hide it from you. We pray for Mitch, whose presence we miss and will miss in the coming days. Open our eyes and our hearts to the healing, the warmth and the peace of your presence. Assure us that those that we miss have a home in your heart as well as ours and a place at your table forever. Open our hearts to joyful memories of the love we shared with those who have gone before us. Help us to tell the stories that bring us close to one another and to the ones that we miss so much. Teach us to lean on you and on each other for the strength we need to walk through these difficult times. Give us quiet moments with you, with our thoughts, with our memories and with our prayers. And in the stillness of the quiet, give us your consolation and your peace. Be with us and hold us in your arms as you hold the ones that we miss. This is the day you have made, O Lord. Help us rejoice and be glad in the peace you've promised and shared with those who have gone before us. For we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Dave, am I opening up an invitation for people 
to go. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. We're doing a team at um, at the house. We go to Highland Road, and we stray afterwards. So, well, as soon as you can go. Okay. So you've been invited, if you would like or are comfortable, to go to the house in Highland Road. Um, you can ask for directions and addresses from any of the family. They all know where it is. There you go. <laughs> um, and you, you can console the family and share those memories and laughs as you have uh, some refreshments. Friends, receive the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Bless you.